So, um, if you were here on Wednesday night, we're studying the book of Revelation, and typical of any class I'm teaching, we ran out of time. So, this is a stopgap where uh, the lesson comes from the text we didn't get to on Wednesday night. And I just want to ask you a question. Are you zealous? Would you consider yourself zealous? And that's the question I want in the forefront of all of our minds today. So let's look at Revelation chapter 3. In his letters to the seven churches in Asia, Jesus is emphasizing a different quality which ought to characterize his people. And when you take them together, they form a model church. And so we ought to be characterized by all these things. So in Ephesus, he talks about the importance of love. In Smyrna, he talks about the importance of enduring, suffering faithfully. In Pergamum, he emphasized the truth. Thyatira, living a holy life, a kind of uh, ethical, righteous life. In Sardis, it was about sincerity and having not just a reputation, but having a true heart for God. In Philadelphia, he talks about uh, taking opportunities, an open door that God provides. But here, the emphasis seems to be on zeal. Now, here's a map of the area we're talking about. This is, I guess it'd be uh, Turkey today, or at least parts of Turkey today. We're looking at Laodicea there, circled in red, and it was the chief city of southern Phrygia. We don't know a whole lot about uh, how the church got its start. Um, as far as we know, Paul isn't the one who started it because he'd never been to any of the churches in the Lycus River Valley. The Lycus River is uh, uh, this little fella here, and it, it goes into the Meander River. And you've got Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis. Uh, we do know there was a church in Colossae. We have Paul's letter to that church, which he'd never been. And evidently, there was a letter to the Laodiceans as well, which Paul mentions in the book of Colossians. And that letter has been uh, lost. But however the church began, by John's day, its condition had really deteriorated. This is a church with a huge problem. Now, again, if you were here on Wednesday night, you will have known every church had its own struggles that, that are mentioned here. Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira, and the rest of them. But in Laodicea, we don't got false teachers here. There's no doctrinal heresy. There's no real immorality to speak of. There's no real persecution mentioned or, or kind of external, external trials. The problem is internal. Look at verse 15. I know your works, Jesus says. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot but you've become lukewarm. Perhaps none of the seven letters are more appropriate for us to hear than this one. There's nothing more discouraging than a lukewarm Christian. It's nauseating to Jesus. We'll see. It's nauseating This describes the kind of nominal, sentimental, skin-deep religiosity which is so widespread today. So, I know that's hard to take, but it's there. It's right there in the text. And we've got to deal with it. We've got to face up to it. Because we might see some of these things in us. And if we do, it's not too late. There's hope. So anyway... We're going to look at this in three, three kind of sections. The heart that Christ desires, the diagnosis that Christ makes, and then the counsel that Christ gives. So let's look at those things in turn. The heart Christ desires, first of all, verses 15 and 16. And if we could sum it up, what kind of heart does Jesus want? Thoughtful zeal. Thoughtful zeal is the attitude here of faith. Look at verses 15 and 16. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, let's go backwards just a tad. 
Uh, Laodicea was really close to two other towns, Hierapolis and Colossae. Can you see them there? Hierapolis to the north, Colossae kind of to the, to the south uh, east. Now, each of those towns had a unique water source. Uh, to the north in Hierapolis, you had a hot spring, and those hot waters would be used for medicinal purposes. And to the east in Colossae, they had a freshwater cold spring. Now, in contrast, Laodicea didn't have a permanent uh, dependable water supply, so they had to get their water piped in uh, from these neighboring towns. But by the time the water got there, guess what happened? It had grown lukewarm. It wasn't hot and it wasn't cold. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, the point is that a drink that is hot or cold can bring healing. It can bring refreshment, right? But a drink which is neither, it's not just tasteless. It's distasteful. It produces nausea. It's nauseating. You want to spit it out of your mouth. You've had that experience. Maybe even this morning you were drinking your cup of coffee. You let it sit too long on the counter, and you said, what is this disgusting stuff, right? And you got to nuke it for a couple of seconds in the microwave. You get the point. Lukewarm, then, met metaphorically, describes this attitude of complacency, of apathy. Somehow this church had lapsed into this tepid indifference. Now, there's no outright denial of Jesus or any kind of core doctrine, but neither was there any fire. There was no zeal. And when Jesus looks on his people and he's not seeing any kind of passion, it makes him sick to his stomach. Do we see that here? Are we willing to come to terms with it? Are we willing to look in the mirror and see if maybe there's some complacency and apathy in our own lives. Zeal. Scripture speaks of our devotion to God as this kind of flame, this spiritual fire. And it's in constant danger of dying out. And so it needs to be poked, it needs to be fed, it needs to be fanned into flame again. It's always in danger of being snuffed out. This little light of mine, right? So the same word for hot here is actually translated in other places as zealous or fervent. It's actually where we get our word zesty, right? There's a spiciness. There's a fervor to it, right? It's hot. And Christ wants to see passion. He wants to see zeal in his people. Now, there's a contingent of us here in America, we're very buttoned up and we don't want to talk about emotions and passion and all of that kind of stuff. And the idea of being on fire for Christ, it might strike some of those people as dangerous emotionalism. But let's balance this out. Jesus is not advocating for unthinking, uncritical devotion. That's not what he's talking about. Remember what Paul said about his Jewish countrymen in Romans chapter 10. They have a zeal for God, but not according to what? Knowledge. It wasn't thoughtful. It wasn't based in God's word. So what Christ wants to see here is thoughtful zeal, a zeal that is informed by truth, that accords with the knowledge of Scripture. So what is Christ's message? to this sleepy-headed, half-hearted church. Verse 19, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. He's looking for enthusiasm. He's looking for fervor, fire, passion. And the reason here is not, of course, that Jesus has this fragile ego and he needs our attention on him all the time. The reason is because the heart that is not passionate about knowing Christ, loving Christ, seeking Christ, serving Christ, is unhealthy. That's a dying heart. It's growing cold. It's growing lukewarm. After all, we were created for him. What does verse 14 say? He is the beginning of creation. Not that he himself was created. No, think of it in terms of he is the originator of creation. All things were made through him. And for him, we were made for Christ. Therefore, if Christ is not 
at the center of our hearts and we're not burning with zeal and passion for him, something is desperately wrong with that heart, right? Something's out of alignment. We were made for him. Therefore, something's always going to be missing. We're never going to find purpose or rest until we find our purpose and rest in him. So the question is, how does this happen? How, how do Christians lapse into apathy? How does a heart become so blasé toward the man who gave his life on the cross for them? Who shed his blood to redeem them of their sins and save them from an eternity in hell? Who came down in the form of a man so that we could be in his presence forever? How could a heart become indifferent to that? How can we avoid this kind of spiritual apathy? Or perhaps if we find ourselves spiritually apathetic, how can we recover from it and cure this kind of divine nausea? Well, look at the good physician in verse 17. He makes his diagnosis. Verse 17. He says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. There's a problem here between what they're saying and the reality, right? What they think of themselves and what God sees in them. And so spiritual apathy is the result of pride. Pride. So the contrast is between what we think of ourselves and what God think, thinks of us. And whose assessment are we going to trust, right? We're <laughs> we tend to build ourselves up and, and think better than ourselves than we are. But God's vision is perfect, right? And that's what Jesus sees here in verse 17. Now, the root cause of their spiritual complacency, the fact that they were lukewarm, is because they had this attitude of self-sufficiency. I don't need anything, right? My life is already figured out. I've got everything I need. So their pride obscured their vision. It blinded them to their own spiritual condition. And they needed a reality check. So the Laodiceans didn't think that they needed anything. You know, back in the first century, the, the city of Laodicea was known for its prosperity. It was, a rich, it was a pretty rich city. In fact, just to give you an example, it was so wealthy that when an earthquake destroyed this region in AD 60, Rome wanted to send aid because it was a colony. And they actually declined financial support from the empire. They said, we'll build it, we'll rebuild it ourselves with our own money because they were so wealthy, right? And they prided themselves on their mercantile banking center. They prided themselves on a famous school of medicine. It was connected with the temple of Asclepius, the god of medicine whose physicians, Aristotle wrote, prepared the Phrygian powder for the cure of ophthalmalia, some kind of inflammation of the eye. So they also had a thriving textile industry. They were well known for making clothes and carpets from this really expensive, glossy black wool uh, of the local sheep that grazed there. But you see how this civic pride had infected the minds of these Christians. The Christians became smug. They became arrogant, self-satisfied. They thought because our physical needs are met, then our spiritual needs are met. They're doing fine spiritually. And so Jesus makes this diagnosis. You don't think you need anything. And you don't realize what you really are. He says you guys are beggars despite your banks. You're blind despite your medical school and your eye medicine. It doesn't have any power to cure your spiritual vision. And you're naked despite your clothing industry. And though they could manage without any kind of imperial subsidy, subsidies to rebuild their city, they couldn't manage without the grace of God to rebuild themselves, their own lives, and God's image. It's interesting to compare this church with the church in Smyrna. Remember the church in Smyrna in chapter 2? They were poor, yet rich. And here is a church that is rich and yet poor. This is what Christ thinks of us when we trust in our wealth, when we trust in our riches, in our own resources, 
and we think we're somebody now. We think that we've got our lives handled and they're under control. We don't really need anything because we have this, that, or the other. And I think this is true. Verse 17 is, is true of all of us, isn't it? This is the reality. We're beggars. What do we have to bring to God to purchase our salvation? Nothing. You have nothing. What do we have to, to clothe ourselves and, and hide our sins. We've got nothing. We're naked before God. We can't cover our guilt. And what do we have? What light do we have to see by without Christ, the light of the world? Again, we're in the darkness. So that's the diagnosis that Christ makes. And finally, what's the counsel that Christ gives? Let's read verses 18 to 21. I counsel you, to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat with my father on his throne. You know, what's interesting to me, verse, verse 18, just how Jesus begins. He's got every right to command these Christians, but he chooses to counsel them. I counsel, I advise you. So instead of compelling obedience through force, he persuades them through reason. And I want you to notice the balance of his counsel. He gives us a negative motivation, right, in the fear of judgment. He says, you give me nausea. I, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, right? That's judgment, being spit out of Christ's mouth. But he provides much more, if we're weighing them on a scale, much more positive motivation by comparison. He gives more positive reasons, doesn't he? Look at his faithfulness. We listen to Jesus' counsel. Why? Because he's trustworthy. Look at how he introduces himself. He's, he is the amen. He is the, the verily, the true word of God, the faithful and true witness. And so we, we want to listen to what he has to say because we can trust what he has to say. We see also his love. Those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. Be zealous and repent, verse 19. It's interesting, too, that Jesus can say in the same letter, you disgust me and I love you. <laughs> we don't normally talk that way, do we? And then his sufficiency, verse 18, buy from me. Come and purchase these things from me, gold and clothing, right? And I salve. We come to him because he is the only one who can actually provide us what our spirits need. The irony is that we come to buy these spiritual necessities from him, but he's actually providing them for us as free gifts, isn't he? <coughs> to be received. Now, he's using this language that's appropriate to that really commercially minded culture. They looked for wealth. They looked for security in all the wrong places. They needed to do business with God. They needed to rely on him. It's very reminiscent of what God said to the Israelites through the prophet Isaiah. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. It's very much like those, those Israelites who were following Jesus in that passage that David read a moment ago in John 6. They were looking for the, for the kind of bread that perishes. That's no security. There's no security in that. They need to find the bread that comes from heaven that Christ is offering us. And so it's free. We can come. We can receive it. But there is a cost, right? There is a cost. And what is it going to cost us to receive these things from Jesus? Well, it's going to cost our own pride. We've got to leave that behind in order to receive these gifts. After all, who is the person who, who, who refuses a gift? It's the person who thinks they don't need it. But if we know that we need it, then we're going to cast our crowns before him, and we're going to accept these gifts. We are poor, but Christ has gold. He has true wealth, heavenly treasure, which moth and rust does not destroy, which no one can break in and steal. We're naked, but Christ has clothes, clothes that can actually cover 
our shame and our guilt and make us pure. As I was taking the Lord's Supper, I wonder if you ever do this. You think back about some of the terrible things that you've done. All the terrible words that you've said and the terrible actions and the sinful things you've done. And it's amazing. While I feel so, so badly about those things that I did, they don't hang over me, haunting me, because I know I'm forgiven of those things. Christ covers me. He covers you. He atones for our sins, giving us that blanket of security, of His grace. Now we can approach His throne in time of need. We're blind, but Christ has the true eye salve, right? He opens our eyes to see the truth. His faithfulness, His love, His sufficiency, and His appeal. Perhaps the most vivid picture is in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He likens our life to a house. Though the house rightfully belongs to him, right? He's the master of the house. When we push him outside, he doesn't force entry back in. Rather, he's knocking on the door. He's imploring us to open the door. Let him in. Let the Savior in, we pray and sing. That knocking represents all of his efforts to reach us through his word. Right? His voice to anyone who hears my voice. That he speaks to us in words like these and opens. And to allow him in. What does that really mean? It means to relinquish our control. To surrender our will to his. To, 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 to cast our pride before him and give him our complete allegiance. And stop trusting in our own meager resources for security. But Jesus doesn't come in only to rule. What is he coming in to do? Verse 20. He's coming in to share. He wants to sit at our table. We're <laughs> he wants to come under the roof of our house. How unworthy are we? And yet he wants to sit by our side. He wants to have fellowship with us. That's what that shared meal illustrates. And of course, Jesus doesn't come in for a short visit, a dine and dash kind of situation, right? He wants to permanently dwell in our lives. And finally, Christ concludes with the typical promise to the conqueror. Verse 21. The person, the person who's the conqueror is the person who hears and obeys the message. That's the one who conquers here. And this one exceeds all the other promises uh, of chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. The one who conquers, verse 21, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Well, what is a throne? A throne is a symbol of authority, right? Jesus once gave his 12 apostles this same promise, that they'll sit with him on his throne. But here he's extending that to all Christian conquerors, to all those who would hear his word, be zealous and repent. As Christ overcame the world and the devil and was exalted to the Father's right hand, so those who overcome him will share the same honor. As Christ shares his Father's throne, we will share Christ's throne. I understand that there's some mystery to that and what that exactly means, but isn't it wonderful to think about that we can reign with Jesus someday if we conquer? If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. This is not a hard letter to understand, I think, in comparison to the other ones. It's very clear. And again, we want to end with the question that we began with. Are you zealous or not? Are you zealous or not? The Spirit is speaking to the churches. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. To be half-hearted, to be complacent, to show only a casual interest in the one who gave himself for us in his sacrificial love, it is utterly nauseating to God. And I'm pleading with you, if Jesus is on the margins of your life and not in the center, this can only result in vehement rejection. I will spit you out of my mouth, he says. But to be wholehearted, to be zealous, in our devotion to Christ, having opened the door of our heart to totally surrender to his will, that's to be given the privilege not only to have fellowship with Christ, but to share in his reign now and forever. 
Jesus was consumed with zeal for his father's house. And he wants us to be consumed with zeal as well. I think the real insidious thing about being lukewarm is that it happens slowly, almost imperceptibly. Because we all, when we were converted, were we not on fire for the Lord? But what happens over time if we don't stoke that flame? If we don't come back to the cross and deepen that passion? We've got to be vigilant. I know this is hard. Hard to talk. It's hard to talk about, and it's hard. It's hard for us to to ask ourselves this question honestly. Am I a zealous Christian or not? I don't get the idea, friend, visitor. I I came to service today to be uplifted and to just feel good about myself and all that. This ain't for you. We serve the Lord Jesus. That's what life is about. That's what life is about. Are you zealous for Christ or not? Let's ask a couple of questions. It really has to do with the heart, right? With the heart. What about seeking guidance? How do you go about seeking guidance? Well, what is a zealous person going to do? They're going to go to God who has wisdom, who has the answers. They're going to pray to him, submitting to his will. They're going to look for guidance in the scriptures. They're going to seek wise Christian counsel. They're going to go to their friends who are not going to tell them what they want to hear. They're going to go to their true friends who tell them what they need to hear, who are going to guide them back to Christ, right? That's what a zealous person who's on fire for the Lord is going to do. Whereas the lukewarm person may not even think about the Bible. They might not even think to pray. Because they think it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, this is the insidious thing about it. It's not like an outright rejection of the resurrection or something like that. It's just this slow, you know, drop in temperature. What about parenting? Parenting. The one who is zealous is going to recognize this child is a gift. It is made in the image of God. I need to raise this child. I need to bring them up spiritually in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. They need daily, constant instruction and discipline. I'm going to love them to the end, just as Jesus loved me to the end, because I want them to be raised to be Christians. I want them to be zealous for the Lord. But the lukewarm, well, I take them to church, you know. They're, they're taking their little, their little Bible class for 40 minutes. That should be enough, right? Lo and behold, when they go off to college, they, 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 they're not under your wing anymore. They fall away. And you wonder why. Could it be because we weren't zealous for Christ? Could it be because we didn't have that hands-on approach? What about wealth? How do you look at your wealth? Christian is going to see their wealth as a gift from God. What a wonderful thing to enjoy. God wants you to enjoy that. He wants you to use it responsibly. He wants you to share it with other people who are in need. Oh, many ways you can, you can use your wealth in God-honoring ways, but in the end, it's not yours. And you surely don't build your life upon it, find your security in it, because you know it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. The person who is lukewarm says, hey, this is what life is about, right? This is my due, and I can use it however I want because it's mine. What about worship? Think about just today. How would you describe, and I'm asking myself these very same questions, how would you describe your worship? Was it zealous? Are you actively engaged? Mind, heart, mouth. Or are you just a passive spectator? What about Bible study? Not just personal Bible study, the kind of reading uh, you know, on, on your own, but Sunday morning, right? 9.30 a.m. every week. Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m. every week. We're here. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Because we're zealous because we want to know more about Christ, right? 
So a zealous person is going to be seeing this as an opportunity for me to grow closer to the Lord Jesus. This is going to be a priority in my schedule. I'm going to be here. Whereas the lukewarm is going to say, kind of optional. If I have time, I'll come. If I don't, no big deal. We're talking about the heart here, aren't we? Right, how are we going to prioritize these things? What about the church? The zealous person is going to say, I'm so glad to be part of God's family. I'm going to love these people. I'm going to get to know them. I'm going to find ways to serve them. Whereas a lukewarm attitude is, I'm going to come, I'm going to get my little sermon, and I'm going to go my happy way. It's really a, a service, right, that I'm going to, to receive. What about evangelism? The zealous person is going to understand, I am saved by Christ so that I can go and save others. This is a debt to the, to the unbelieving world that I owe to them because God loved me, I want to love them. A lukewarm Christian is going to say, well, that's really only for special Christians. You know, only for the special ones. And so again, it's kind of, kind of optional. What about just kindness and showing hospitality, inviting people to service or inviting people into your home and just extending that kind of kindness. Well, again, we, a zealous person is going to want to exhibit Christ's character to everyone they meet. Here at the building, out in the world, they're going to show that Christian kindness and that character. But again, someone who is lukewarm is just going to think, hey, that's someone else's job. Let them do that. Someone will, be, someone will take care of that, right? So I've gone over a little bit. But I appreciate you guys listening very kindly, uh, and I appreciate your respect that you've, you've given here. But I do want you to, to answer that question in your own heart. Are you zealous? Are you zealous? And le listen, if the answer is a resounding no, you know, I, after looking at this, I don't think I am zealous. Jesus doesn't hate you. He loves you. And he reproves you and he disciplines you because he wants you to repent and be zealous. There's hope here. There's hope here. If you've pushed Jesus to the margins, then he's standing at the door and he's knocking. Will you let him in? If you need to respond to this message, then you can come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs>